I would like to welcome you here today for the presentation which is going to be given by my dear friend Gregers Peterson. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Gregers at the Danish Linux Forum conference earlier this year and we had some very interesting conversations about uh, anthropology and open source projects. So Gregers is here to give us a talk today on reorganizing and non-transactions. And it's basically going to be about uh, the sociology of open source software projects, yeah? Maybe. Maybe? Maybe. <laughs> if we're lucky, that's what we'll get. All right, take it away, Gregors. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, as noted, I'm going to speak on reorganizing and non-transactions. Sometimes it's really nice with cryptical t titles. And it's uh, licensed under GPL.20. Um, the background for this talk today is that I'm right now conducting anthropological research into uh, property relations and notions and expressions of ownership in boundary locations between one specific free software project and commercial companies, commercial interests. And uh, in this context, my, my, or let's say my setting in anthropological terms is uh, within a project called OpenWRT Org, which is uh, developing originally alternative firmwares for cheap wireless routers, and now is moving into being a complete embedded platform. Um, and in that sense, OpenWRT is my tribal village. It's where I have my tent. If I speak in kind of classical, cliche kind of anthropological words. Um, and I'll talk on uh, an, an, a look at an alternative explanation for the underlying social system of open source software or free software cultures and hopefully be able to explore some of the implications of this. Um, the focus will be on uh, a notion on cultures of sharing um, and uh, how such cultures of sharing are recognized or can be recognized as new kinds of actors who are going into processes of reorganizing the market. Um, and um, the background for this is that um, over the last decades, it's been more and more interesting for a lot of entities to appropriate or, uh, let's see, say, take over cultural products. Um, and uh, in that sense, cultural products would be traditional knowledge and objects, uh, typically, like third world uh, tribal uh, knowledge, tribal insight, tribal objects. It can be anything from a drum to knowledge about uh, medical herbs. Um, and these, are, these different tribal products or cultural products are being appropriated and converting into, converted into commodities. And in that way, they're becoming included in a market-based economy. Um, and this makes it quite interesting to explore how this traditional knowledge, and I'm using the term traditional knowledge also as covering open source software and free software. Uh, so I'm playing a little bit on this metaphor uh, and looking at how this is defended in terms of alternative models of ownership. Um, and you can generally say that if you should characterize the world of free and open source software, then it's a social system. Um, and as such, uh, it's based on a certain set of assumptions. Um, you might say there is a logic to it. Uh, and this logic on the rights, everyday activities, and basically this particular form of social organization. Um, and another thing you can say is that all forms of social organization, uh, societies, produce and distribute cultural products. It's like something you can say that there is something which is being done. And this being done by a, a certain society is production of anything from knowledge to objects. Um, and if you look at um, free and open source software, societies or cultures, it's all typically likened to a system based on gift economy. Um, and gift economy is uh, cyclic exchanges of gifts and returning reciprocity, which again will say that you have 
one part, one individual or entity which hands over a gift to another, uh, giving a gift. This creates a reciprocity relationship where this other individual or entities is being required to return the gift. In that sense, you have like cyclic returning or continuous returning of gifts. In that sense, you can say that this cyclic system of constant exchange and returning and giving gifts becomes a society. That's a basic assumption. Uh, and this, what is important here is that you have relationships between in defined and known partners which are created over time. So it's not like necessarily that as soon as you give a gift, then you, it has to be returned the same minute or the subsequent minute. It can be in 100 years. But you have defined and well-known sets of relationships between known partners. And uh, in the context I am in, this requirement of having transactions or exchange between known partners does somehow disappear. It makes me, at least it makes me wonder. Um, then if you look at how a, a software project works, you have like a repository. Here you have a developers adding source to the repository. You have a lot of people who are checking out the source, but they're not necessarily returning anything to it. They don't necessarily have any sort of relationship with these developers, not in not like in a generalized sense. So that you, don't, you can't really say that there is like a, a gift relationship or an exchange. It's just, you know, it becomes very, very generalized and maybe even abstract. Um, so it seems to disappear. And uh, so I, for a while I was wondering there, because there is like a continuous flow. Things keep flowing. They're not like hidden. They're public, they're flowing, they're moving, uh, they're circulating. But actually, what makes that happen? What is that kind of that drives this flow and circulation? Um, I think there's a, a British, or I know there's a British anthropologist, James Leach, who took a look at this. And he said, you have a basic system which says, uh, and which says and states and recognizes individual authorship, you know, credits, source code credits. It's clearly defined who started this. There's like a biography. And uh, so in that sense, you can say there's a basis there. Everyone knows who made this or who started it out, who has kind of credits, who has to be credited, credited in a continued life of this piece of source code. Um, but uh, if you look, if you sit there as an individual coder or hacker or, or author, you can either just sit and keep your code to yourself or you can distribute it. And by distributing it, it becomes coherent. Suddenly it makes sense that you did the work. You add it to something more. Uh, you add it to the flow. So that could be something which drives it, but uh, There's still something missing. And um, I had, I've kind of been, again, like thinking a bit about this. And there's a, a different researcher, Rishabh Ghosh, who's uh, the head of or the leader of the European Floss projects. And, and he's kind of also been looking at this problem. And he has introduced this notion of the tribal cooking bot. And I have to apologize for my writing. It's not very nice. Tribal cooking pot. And uh, his background is economics. So he's trying to make model an economic model on this. And uh, so he says, there's this tribal cooking pot. Everybody who has something adds it to the cooking pot. Uh, you have this big, wonderful stew who's probably is going to taste basically the same year out, year in. Uh, and uh, by adding something to this cooking pot, it will always contain more than you can produce yourself. So 
it becomes more and more valuable in economical terms. And uh, in that sense, there comes a logic to, by adding something to this pot, you actually become entitled to more than you can produce yourself. And everybody is free to take out of what it is they want. But again, this, this sounds quite nice, but it, it's again, hmm, you end up with this profit notion. The individuals can profit on this. It's like they make more out of it. And uh, it's just, when I look at my empirical work, like the ethnographical work I'm involved in, this profiting, this notion of, of kind of counting or measuring things in money and economic calculations is not really in, a, in any way as a central aspect of everyday life. So there's still you know, these questions marks which I, kept, I keep having. And uh, I think the problem is that by this, something like this model, you introduce a notion of the calculative man, that we are all calculating our daily, everyday life in terms of money and profit. Um, and in that way, what we do and engage into becomes commodities, something which has a value, which I'm trading for something else. You are inching in towards a money-based economy, or at least a, a very clearly commercial and commoditized model. Um, and you can say about this is that, uh, returning to the gift, gift exchange systems underwrites social relationships, continued social relationships across time. Uh, whereas money or commodity exchange underwrites the existence of commodities. So it's like either you have a continued existence of relationships, human relationships, valuable relationships, or you have a continued reproduction of valuable objects, commodities. And, and both are kind of not really, they make, still makes me kind of worry about certain things in respect to my field work. And one is that, as I already stated, this sense of commodities, it's not really what I experience. People are not involved in producing in the project I'm living in or I'm being part of just because of that they look at it as a commodity which they can sell and profit on. Um, and they're not, neither are they really involved in it as an expression of gift economy, a gift exchange, because there is no free gift. If you give a gift to somebody, it always has to be returned. And there's actually these, now there's a transaction, there's a requirement of a transaction which needs to go on. And in that context I am in, there is actually a lack of this returning of the gift. So there's like also there, there's like this question mark, what is it then? Um, and you can say, if you look at it as a social system, the introduction of, in general terms, the introduction of uh, a commodity-based exchange system is very often a, a threat to these social structures because they become an, e an alternative. And alternatives are also something which changes accepting or existing aspects. Uh, and uh, so you're not, in this context I'm in, you're not talking about notions of value flows. It's like there isn't really anything which is measured in terms of commodity value. And it is neither measured in terms of, of uh, gift exchange relationships because they aren't really there. You don't have these partners which exchange which, with each other. They're something else. Um, and what could this else be? And I can say, okay, these transactions I would expect to find in a gift system or commodity system are missing. Uh, and um, I started looking around in, in more classical anthropological mater material um, and um, suddenly I felt and that I found some similarities in, uh, in what you normally call primitive hunter-gatherer 
cultures. Um, because they are based on sharing cultures. They're based on, on a, a model of social organization which is, is expressed through demand sharing. Um, and what you can say what constitutes such a hunter-gatherer community or a group is that they're typically small mobile roaming groups. They are highly egalitarian. Their social organization is based on direct, immediate return sharing. Uh, there's a distinct lack of private individual property. You don't really have a sense of, I have something which is definitely mine. There's like a lot of things, but they typically keep circulating within the community, within the group. Um, if you hunt something, it belongs to you. Uh, there is like a sense of individual ownership, authorship, but as soon as you have stated, okay, I killed that thing, or I found this tree with fruits on it, then it is demanded that you need to share it. There's a question. Basically, it's an accepted uh, convention in the literature. So, and the egalitarian sense is that you don't have a, like you typically don't have a, a chief. You don't have like a hierarchical system in that classical state oriented system, uh, notion. You have a, a horizontal model. But it's, it's you know, I understand your question. It's kind of, it it's always gets into a gray zone when you start looking at it. So, because somebody, you always have somebody who has more knowledge than others, or are better to a certain and more respected. And yeah, mm. yeah. But it's also something that uh, you can't really say that you have individuals who have a clear sense of power to initiate certain activities. They cannot like just state, "You, you, and you have to help me with this." It's an individual can say. Okay, I think I'm going to wander over there. Anybody who wants to follow me are free, but you don't have to. So in that sense, it's egalitarian. Uh, and what also is a characteristic here is that you have no control over who gets what. If you add something, if you share something, everybody is entitled, and you can't say, you cannot have anything. Uh, there is no reciprocity, so you're not required to give something to back. If you're like a really bad hunter, sorry, but you're still entitled to meat. <laughs> it doesn't matter that you never kill anything. Um, and in that sense, success is no insurance for getting something in, re in return. So it's kind of a little bit odd to think in this way. Um, and you can ask then, OK, why do developers or hunters with success share? There's a sense of coherence, as I already said. Makes, makes meaning, gives it meaning, makes it, uh, creates a sense of belonging. Uh, this ha a hacker, a coder, he, he can sit there in his own little room, office, building, and gorge on his own code, but if he doesn't put it into the flow of the circulation, it doesn't have any meaning, it's, it's non-existent. So it, be it creates existence, it it creates a biography, and it creates a, a continued flow. Uh, and in that sense, you can also say that uh, by releasing it, this coder or, or hacker or author loses control over his work. He cannot decide, OK, nobody, if, if I put it onto a server on the internet, I'm, I'm not able to say, you, you, and you are not, are not allowed to have access to my code, at least not directly. And if you state it, it doesn't help you anything because they'll get it anyway somehow. So it's more that you share it openly um, into this sharing sphere. And you can say that in that sense, a sh the essence of a sharing culture is actually to keep flow circulation going. Things have to be in constant circulation because in that way, you cannot turn them into individual property. 
you can turn it, it becomes a, a collaborative ownership model. Uh, and in that sense, um, by looking at this constant and maintaining and reproduction of flow and circulation, I think it is possible in some ways to look at the production of free and open source software as being a, an expression of a culture of sharing, which is different from other models of social organization. Uh, and. Uh, And in that sense, you can say what is being expressed is a, mod is a model of uh, collaborative or social, uh, a model of social organization, which is based on collaborative ownership, a constant flow. Like everybody is entitled, everybody has kind of a stake in it, despite that you haven't added to it or you haven't produced to it, but you are participating in maintaining the flow. Uh, and that opposes this generalized commodity-based market economical model we're living in. And can one say, okay, why does that oppose that? Um, I think if you look at um, like the basic premises of the market, is that um, the market is based on the ident identification of an object, an idea, a product, uh, and the recognition, the recognized, it is recognized that this object, thing, idea belongs to somebody. There's a defined ownership relationship. But before this can be turned into a commodity, this thing, this object, this idea has to be alienated. This ownership recognizing has to be cut, uh, has to be detached from strings. And uh, in that sense, it becomes what you call a, a calculative object, an object which is calculated in a calculative commons. You have a setting where you have certain defined entities which are putting a price on this thing because suddenly it is free to be exchanged in terms of money, because it has no prior ties anymore. Um, and uh, in that sense, when I look at the everyday life I'm part of, it's not really possible to alienate this code which is produced by the project I'm living and I'm part of. Um, it's not possible to detach the cultural product from its owner, producer, which is, in the sense, the project I'm involved with. Um, and this means that uh, it's not possible to pull one specific object, like this, this in this case, source code or software, out of uh, the flow it's in. You cannot take it out and stop it and isolate it and turn it into a commodity. And uh, in that sense, you're not able to facilitate the normal actions of a market-based economy. Um, and it doesn't become possible to create transactions. It's like a world of non-transactions. And in that sense, you have an introduction of a, some sense, a paradox, which is based on that you have a reality of Something might be given or shared, but it's still kept. So you have a, a, a basis that says something might be given, but it's still kept. It's also called giving while keeping. So you might have that the project I'm involved in is giving, sharing their source code freely, but they still keep it theirs. It still belongs to the project as a social, social entity. Um, so in that sense, in my context, I'm in the demographic context I'm in, it's not possible to alienate what is being produced by this specific culture or cultural group. 
Uh, and in that sense, if this is done or made, or some entity makes attempts at appropriating this code, like placing it inside a product and black boxing this product, not st stating, we're not telling you what's inside it. Then um, the ownership, the collaborative ownership of the project will be initiated and uh, this right to ownership, the recognition of it's their work, will be defended. In the same way as you, you see it uh, with several uh, like tribal groups, like third world groups, who are defending their traditional knowledge. Um, and in that way, this defense does also reproduce this whole ownership structure, which is based on collaborative notions. Um, and this defense can take like basic, I suppose several of you have like notions that social shaming, just naming uh, that this and this person with this and this nickname is uh, doing something we don't, we don't like by stating, okay, you have this piece of hardware, we know that there is this system running inside it, why don't you just state it on your website? Um, it can be exclusion from participation communication in forums and IRC channels, or, and uh, to some extent also exclusion from having access to a source repository. Um, but it can also be, an, an, the end point is that a li right or license can be terminated. The right to use the software can be terminated if the requirements are not met, if the flow is not reproduced by the different entities which are using the software. And in that sense, you can say there's a logic that if you participate, if you help maintain, reproduce the flow, uh, like if you make a kill for a hunter-gatherer hunter, uh, or find the tasty fruit, you keep the flow going by sharing. And, but if you do not share, if you do not participate on these rules, you will be expelled eventually. There is certain leniency, there is a lot of boundary land and a lot of gray zones, but eventually if you do not respect the rules, you will be expelled. But in what way is this reorganizing the market? That's kind of the last questions I've tried to ask. And I think, um, it's recognizing it in that way that this particular mode of collaborative ownership or cultural production uh, is introducing the reality and the existence of different modes of ownership. You do not only have one which is focused on commodity economy, the individual singular ownership of certain things which you can then sell and distribute as you like and control and hide and whatever you want. Uh, but that you have uh, more than one expression mode of ownership. You have a singular, you have a, a parallel uh, collaborative plural ownership model. You have models based on sharing, you have models based on gift exchange. But it introduces a reality where there isn't, or there isn't necessarily one model which takes care of everything. So you have different opposing and competing logics. Um, and I think that's the way something like the production of free and open source software is reorganizing the market by introducing new and different logics as actual real world living alternatives based on flow and circulation. Um, and I think that's primarily the way or the basically the point I wanted to make today is that you have a number of opposing or competing systems which are crystallizing right now. And in that sense, you have the creation of very, very large, like boundary zones or boundary locations or gray zones where these logics interact. And they are changing each other, so things are being reorganized. But what is especially interesting is that you have this emergence of cultures based on flow and circulation that 
objects, cultural objects, cultural products, knowledge, has to be circulating. And that this creates different types of ownership structures than what we normally experience in our everyday life. They've always, it's, it's like, it's nothing new, I have to state that. You've always had very different models of ownership. But you have, right now, you have been a, in a long period, time period where one particular model has been dominant. I think this dominance is changing right now. So the relationships of the market are, in that sense, being reorganized by new kinds of actors who are very, very or impossible to buy for money. It's like the project I'm involved in. You cannot buy the project for money. So you cannot take over the ownership and control it in a market economic model. And I think that's basically the conclusion. That's what I'm involved in, is all about flow and circulation. Um, and in that sense, I would, of course, like to say thank you to my wonderful project, OpenWRT, and Leslie for hosting me here today. No, I do it anyway. <laughs> so I think that was pretty much what I wanted to say today. Hmm? Thank you. But, but, you know, you mentioned this question before about this egalitarian, and it is a difficult question, because how do you understand egalitarian structures? Um, I think, again, as I said, uh, the best way is to see, are you, do you have individuals with power, or do you have individuals with, by acting well, or, acting, or being good examples, or being respected, who are able to ask people to help them? I think that's a distinction. Do you have like power? Do you have a bigger gun? Uh, or are you able to persuade people to follow your lead? Because I think, oh, it's probably going to work out pretty good. Hmm? So, yeah? So another question is, so what happens on the boundary of, what do you see as happening on the boundary of open source, larger open source projects? Or they become interesting to companies or players who are purely market-based? I think some of them are being involved in, in a market economy. Like money starts, like if you have a big project uh, with uh, people who are paid for doing work, you have to find money for them. So you're kind of like being integrated more or less. Um, so, in some sense, it depends to a certain degree on what license are you licensing your work under, um, what specific needs, requirements do you have for reproducing your structure, like this, the project. Um, and I can say um, the project I'm involved in is, for example, extremely different from something like Apache. Um, it's very egalitarian, where for me, Apache is very hierarchical, very structured, very much like a business. Um, it acts like a well-known business actor. You know, you can like say, OK, there's a certain logic to it. Whereas the project I'm involved in is very egalitarian. There is no money in it. There is no sources of funding. Um, and it's very important for this group to keep things that way, because they become independent. And in that sense, by creating this independence, they're also able to, again, move as a different kind of actor. Because they are able to uh, handle that commercial companies are approaching them, specifically because they are independent. They're not you know, pulling anybody's strings or being pulled by anybody's strings. So I think that's, again, you have a, a, a huge variety of what goes on. And some projects are more prone to becoming business-like than others. And I think that's this huge boundary zone which acts there. Um, and for me, that's extremely inter interesting, um, as long as it doesn't necessarily move in just one direction. You know, I'm kind of chaotic, so I like it in lots of directions. <laughs> yeah? Anything else?
or should we? Moving in just one direction. Yeah. Do you think we need examples where a, you have a project that moves uh, not backwards necessarily, but more towards the uh, egalitarian tribal structure, more loosely constrained structure? Ooh. I think maybe um, what happened earlier this year with um, Apple's Darwin project, um, where you had these, you had something like Mac ports, or at that point in time, Darwin ports, and you have like a cluster of projects which are quite quite closely uh, related to some work done by Apple, and some code which was licensed by Apple, and then you had certain changes would closed off Darwin for a while, and uh, which initiated that some of it, the whole Darwin project fell apart. Uh, and uh, you had a project like the prior Darwin ports, which then went to, took a name change, change Mac ports. And I think they have gone towards a more independent line, because they have definitely realized we cannot depend on constant or continuous support from a company like Apple. Because they are under certain market dynamics and they have certain market interests with which they have to protect. And we as a project, Macports, have a different interest. Um, but I think it's, um, again, it's, it's difficult to say if this is a real example of that. But it's at least something where I can say that something happened and it changed the structure of the background. But again, it's difficult to like pinpoint this and this and this. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Should we call it a day?